recording. Uh, first off, before we start, does anyone have any questions over last week's homework? You can go ahead, raise your hands, put it in the Q&A, put it in the chat, any questions at all. All right, if there's nothing, uh, let's get started. This will be uh, the last class for world, hi world history. We'll just be finishing up the 1200 to 1450 era. So we have a lot of content to go through today. Okay, so first off, we're gonna start with the trade routes from 200 BCE to 1500 CE. Let's start with the Silk Road. So the Silk Road is one of the most important trade routes and we can see here it goes all the way from uh, China into India, goes into Greece, Russia, Iraq, all the way into the Middle East. It had a very far, uh, very far reach. So the objectives of this are to explain the causes and effects of growths and net growth and networks of change. Also to explain how improved commercial practices led to an increase in volume of trade and expanded the geographical range of existing trade routes promoting the growth of cities and the growth of interregional trade and luxury goods and how it was in, uh, encouraged by innovations in previ previously existing commercial technologies like the caravans, forms of credit, and the development of money economies. Also the demand for luxury goods that increased in Afri ratio. So Chinese, Persian, and Indian artisans and merchants expanding the production of textiles and porcelain. So the origins. Beginning in around second century BC between the Parthian Empire and Han China was when the Silk Road began. It connected Northern China with Mesopotamia. So if you remember Mesopotamia is around the Middle Eastern area, Middle East India, and cities on the Mediterranean coast like Rome and India. So relay trade, this, which meant uh, no direct connections between Rome and China, and interaction between pastoral and agricultural peoples. The Chinese, Persian, and Arab traders used Central Asian nomads and their animals, like horses and camels, to carry their goods in caravans. Goods were traded and sold in markets in the cities of the large empires and trading cities founded along the route between China and the Black Sea. which included cities like Samarkand and Buchara. The spread of technology. So technology involved horse riding and pack animals. So uh, the stirrup was invented by Kushan in the first century CE. It traveled to Europe, which was the Knights and uh, to China. Yokes and saddles were to use on Bactrian camels because they adapted to the dry climate and the cold winters. And paper making was by the Abbasid Empire. Remember we talked about the Abbasids when we talked about Islam who won the Battle of Talus against the Tang Dynasty and captured Chinese paper makers. The spread of technology also continued with silk production, which was first in China. The technology was then adopted by the Byzantine Empire in the 6th century CE and later Persians, Koreans, and the Japanese. Gunpowder was first developed in China in the 8th century CE, then adopted by Mongols and brought to the Middle East and Europe in 13th and 14th century. This is a picture of a Westerner on a Bactrian camel in the Tang Dynasty. You can see all the parts of the picture. The exchange of goods was the exchange of luxury items between large empires. This first flourished the trade between the Roman and the Han empires, which was the second century BCE to the second century CE. Then again, between the Tang Empire, Abbasids, and the Byzantine Empire, which was seventh century CE to the ninth century CE. The last flourishing was in uh, 13th and 14th centuries with Mongols control controlling all the trade routes between China and Europe. If you remember a couple classes ago, we talked about the Mongols and how they took complete control of China, part of Russia, uh, Central Asia, and therefore they had control of the Silk Road as well. The exchange of goods also continued with China who produ uh, that produced silk and lacquerware, si Siberia and Central Asia produced furs, walrus tusks, livestock, livestock, hides, and slaves. India produced cotton cloth, precious stones, and spices. The Middle East produced dyes, lapis lazuli, swords, and carpets. And the Mediterranean produced gold coins, glassware, jewelry, olive oil, so on. The exchange of agricultural knowledge also came through the Silk Road, which meant uh, China, uh, the, uh, the agricultural knowledge of ginger and rhubarb, 
India, how to grow cotton, sugar cane, Middle East was dates and almonds, and the Mediterranean was grapes and apricots. So the agricultural technology was also uh, the Quanax, which was first developed in Persia, and the knowledge of it passed along trade routes and spread to many parts of the Middle East and, the Central, and Central Asia. This is also the exchange of agricultural technology. So here we see a form of irrigation species in the mother well, the main water source for the Quanax, the access shaft, Quanax channel, the outlet, and the distribution to the irrigated land. You can see the bedrock, the water table, and the alluvium underneath it as well. As well um, as for exchanges of people and culture, there was Nestorian Christianity, which was uh, Nestorial churches in the Chinese capital, Buddhism adopted by the Central Asians, spread to China by 2nd and 3rd century CE, and the Iranian peoples replaced by Turkic-speaking peoples in the 6th century. So Muslim Arabs arrived in the 8th century, bringing Islam, and Islam, dominant religion, was a dominant religion along the Silk Road by around the 10th century, or 900 CE. The spread of Buddhism also became, uh, became very prominent. So Buddhism spread, spread to Central Asia through these trade contacts in the Silk Road. Trading cities in Central Asia like Samarkand, Merv, Dinhang converted voluntarily to Buddhism, which provided a link to wealthy and prestigious Indian culture and society. So foreign merchant communities introduced Buddhism to Northern China and Buddhist monasteries provided a cultural, culturally familiar places on a long journey. Nomadic rulers of northern China converted to Buddhism in the 3rd century CE and uh, Mahayana Buddhism, which was which viewed Buddha as a deity with bodhisattvas, the emphasis on compassion and less on austerity, began to become more prominent through the Silk Road spread. The mixing of ethnicities and religions also happened. So blue-eyed Central Asian Buddhists with a monk at, with an East Asian colleague in China in the 9th to 10th century. You can see that right here in this picture. Spread of diseases was also something that happened through the Silk Road. So smallpox and measles in the Roman and Han empires in the second and third century CE, and the devastating, uh, which, was, which devastated the population and led to collapse of many empires. So we talked about the collapse of the Byzantine Empire and such, which um, disease was part of the cause for that. They both also helped spread uh, Christianity or Buddhism as they offered compassion in times of extreme suffering. The spread of diseases it continued with the outbreaks of the bubonic plagues. So between 534 and 750 CE, this weakened Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire, and it helped the Arab conquest of these areas. So in the 14th century, from China to Europe, it also, it also occurred, also spread, and it killed about a third of China and Europe's population. So it also undermined the Mongol rule in China and allowed China to take back control. All right, now for a quick activity before we continue. Come up with a thesis statement, uh, as we talked about in one of the first class about the LEQs for essays. So a thesis statement, uh, to what extent did the expansion of empires influence long distance trade and communication? Explain the intellectual and cultural effects of the various trade networks in Afro-Eurasia 1200, 1450, or explain the causes and effects of the growth of networks of exchange 1200 to 1450. So just pick one of these and we'll take five minutes and we can, uh, after that, we can reconvene and take a look at some of the thesis statements that you have. Remember, a thesis statement is just a main statement. It will answer the question and provide two reasons. They don't need to have evidence. They don't need to be supported. Just answer the question, provide two reasons uh, as to why your answer is correct. We'll take about five minutes to do that. So 4.15, we can reconvene and take a look at all the answers.
All right, so it's 4.15, let's take a look. I only got one thesis statement, so let's read it outside, out loud. It says, the expansion of empires, so they chose uh, the first choice, they said the expansion of empires greatly influenced long distance trade and communication because those empires can control who and what goes through the trade cities in their empire and can influence or be influenced by other empires or culture. So this is a solid thesis statement. You have, uh, you have you brought up control you brought you brought up yeah, you brought up the control you brought up the influence you brought up culture pop, and politics economics but what you would want to do is you, you would want to be a little bit more specific in your reasons and try to bring up specific empires or specific cultures you could bring up um, the byzantine empire you could bring up buddhism such things but for now you have a solid answer and i would just keep building off of that okay let's move on the Indian Ocean. So this is Indian Ocean trade routes. You can see the red lines are where, where it went through. You can see it's more it's more water based than land based as the Silk Road was. The objectives here are to explain the causes and effects of growth of networks of change, explain how improved commercial practices led to an increase in volume of trade and expanded the geographical range of existing trade routes, promoting the growth of cities. And I'll just let you read the rest of those. Just take a minute to look at what this is going to be about. So this is the origins of Indian Ocean trade. And this is a maritime technology. So there were lots of large distances covered, pro probably made by monsoon, which was the Dows with the Latin sails growing from 100 tons, 1200 uh, to 400 tons in, for, in 1500. And the Eastern part junks of about 1500 tons and 12, up to 1,500 tons and 12 masts in the year 1,400. So larger ca cargo allowed trade of bulk goods like timber and grains and large ships, compass, and a growing Chinese economy during the Song Dynasty led to a great increase in trade volume since the 10th century CE. This is a picture following the monsoon. This is a Dao. A Dao is a boat. And the Latin sail is this triangle-shaped sail that was supposedly uh, make the ships move faster. This is the treasure ship of a Chinese pirate. So the goods traded were, uh, the transportation costs were lower than overland trade. There were more bulk goods on the Silk Road. From Arabia, there was incense, myrrh, carpet, horses, goods from the Mediterranean, and from India, there were precious stones. So we went over spices, cotton textiles, Africa had gold, ivory, and slaves, Indonesia had spices, and China had silk and porcelain. The exchange of people and culture was many different cultures were involved, like in uh, African culture, there was Swahili, there was Arab culture, Indian culture, Malay, Chinese traders, the network of trading cities along the coast as well. So Salafa, Kiowa, Aden, Calicut, Basra, Malacca, Guangzhou, with merchants from many different nationalities. So there was also the exchange of peoples, uh, people and culture. So Malay sailors caused uh, out-trigger canoes to travel and settle in Madagascar brought Austronesian language, uh, Austronesian uh, language to Africa, new food crops like bananas, coconuts, Greek and Jewish traders establishing communities in Kerala. So Christianity, Judaism in India, Christianity spreading to Ethiopia and Buddhism and Hinduism spread to Southeast Asia. That would be like Indonesia, Malaysia, those sort of areas. It continued with Islam, the friendly attitude towards merchants, a common set of laws for everyone who is Muslim, the creation of Arab empires who create an immense market and new opportunities for trade, Muslim traders coming to India, East Africa, Southeast Asia, and China, slave trade from Africa, which was stimulated uh, which, uh, by sugarcane plantations in Mesopotamia, and by 1000 CE, majority of the merchants were Islamic, and Islam replaced Hindu and Buddhism in India. This continued into East Africa as well, which was Bantu-speaking peoples living along the coast, traded with Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. Arab traders brought Islam, and this leads to a syncretic culture, which meant of a mixing of cultures. So most trading cities became Muslim, but the new language became Swahili, which was a Bantu language with many Arabic words written in an Arabic script. East Africa included Swahili culture, which dominated the East African coast between 1000 and 1500. 
which had about 30 city-states, export of many luxury items. Uh, Ibn Battuta, who praised Muslim learning in mosques and the society, which uh, praised a mercantile elite and had commenter, uh, commoners and the communities of Arab, Persian, and Indian traders. Kingdoms in Southeast Asia included Sri Vijaya on Sumatra and controlled the choke points of trade between 670 and 1000. The choke points would be, uh, it's just that narrow, the narrow strait of water between two, between two pieces of land and they were very, 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 very good for trade. This also included access to the sources of spices like cloves, nutmeg, mace, taxes, passing ships, uh, beginnings of bureaucracy and the adoption of Buddhism and the spread of Buddhism as well. This is a map that you can take a look at. And someone asked, what is myrrh? Myrrh is just like a gum resin sort of thing that they traded back then. Okay. Kingdoms in Southeast Asia also included Sailandra, which was a Buddhist kingdom in Java, Indonesia, which had an agricultural base, built the largest Buddhist temple worldwide. The Khmer Kingdom, which was also in Cambodia and Thailand, and had a large capital city with large Hindu and Buddhist, the, with large Buddhist and Hindu temples in the Angkor Wat, and it showed influence of the Indian architecture. This is the Angkor Wat built in, uh, in Cambodia, built in 11th century. It was a Hindu temple at the time. This is Borobudur in Java. All right, I'll give examples of cultural and economic exchanges and the Indian Ocean trade routes. So come up with a thesis statement, what extent did environmental factors continue to impact the Indian Ocean trade network? We're not gonna do this right now because we have a lot of content to cover, but I strongly suggest you just copy this down, just write it down or take a screenshot of just this, just this question and uh, think about this at home uh, as a practice for your LEQs. I'll give you a second to do that. All right, now for Trans-Saharan trade. So we're gonna move on to Africa and uh, mostly Northern Africa. These are the objectives of this, this unit and the origins of Trans-Saharan trade. So camels allowed trade across the Sahara Desert. So there were two types of saddles, one for military purposes and one for transporting goods. So caravans were sometimes led with thousands of animals, which followed oases led by Berbers and the Tuareg, starting in the Roman Empire, and it also declined with the decline of the Roman Empire. So regular trade in the eighth century began with the rise of the Arab Empire and Berbers, Arabs in the South, and mostly Bantu speaking peoples in the South. The exchange of goods also continued in the Middle East and North Africa with manufactured items, carpets in the Sahara with salt, West African kingdoms, gold slaves, forest products like palm oil and nuts, and the first empire in West Africa was Ghana, so third century CE. The others included, uh, oh yeah, and then Mali and then Songhe. So the others included Khan and Bornu and the Hausa states, and Islam became a dominant religion while the African traditional religions were still strong. The exchange of culture was also the spread of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa, spread of literacy, mixing of population, and camels come into widespread use in West Africa. This is just a map of Africa's kingdoms and empire. Yeah, thousands of camels, it's quite a lot. This is Mansa Musa, the king of Mali and Haji. Mansa Musa is one of, was one of the richest men in history and he had so much gold and he distributed so much of it that he literally uh, made the price of gold, the, the worldwide, the global price of gold go down. That's how much gold he had. This is Ibn Battuta's travels. He's another uh, world traveler, kind of like Marco Polo for, for reference, they've also given you Marco Polo's travels. As for the Islamic ritual, Ibn Battuta on Mali. So uh, these people are Muslims, punctilious and observing the hours of prayers, uh, studying books of law and memorizing the Quran. Uh, someone asked a question, someone said, 
uh, not like a palace of gold. He just had a lot of gold. Like as currency back then, they didn't really have like paper money, paper like just coins and things like that. So they would use, they didn't really have paper money. So they would just use gold. Like I would give you gold, like trade gold for, uh, trade gold for, for goods, like maybe spices and things like that. He had so much of it and he distributed so much of it that he devalued the global price of gold. Women in non-Arab Muslim countries. We'll be talking about uh, women in, the, in this era in just a little bit. So Ibn Battuta on Turkish women. This is just a primary source. You can read that on your own. And women in Mali. As for economic innovations during this time, there was checking credit in banks, which was introduced by Muslim merchants, and they provided capital needed for long distance trade. Large empire and a common system of laws. Remember, we talked about uh, the Dar al Islam, the Islamic State, and the Sharia law made it easier to trust the faraway business partners. During this time, paper money began in China, which was introduced by the Song Dynasty, the 10th century CE, and common currencies included the Arabic dinar, the common coinage of Tang and Song China, which made trade easier, and the decimal system was adopted by Arab and then Italian merchants. You get these, this is also something that you can work on at home, work on by yourself. Give examples of cultural and economic ex exchanges on the Saharan trade routes. To what extent did environmental factors continue, continue to impact the trans-Saharan trade route and support the argument with evidence? You can save this for later or just copy it down so you can work on this at home, but there's a lot of content to cover today, so we'll just have to move on. Okay. As for the Americas. So the geography of America was a north-south orientation, which is jungle, small land bridge between uh, North and South America, and there was a travel and diffusion of plants and animals was difficult. Few exceptions, like maize, which was corn. There was large, uh, lack of large pack animals and large ships, and there was no intense contact between the North and South Americas. Several regional trade networks were also in the Americas, the Mississippi Trade Network, Mesoamerica, Andes Mountains, and the Caribbean Trade. This is a map of, just so you can see, the areas in North America, South America, that were significant. All right, for Mesoamerica, there was trade between uh, Teotihuacan and the Mayans. There was overland trade and trade between Pacific and Atlantic coasts and large canoes, mostly luxury items that traded in long distance trade, exotic feathers, gems, cocoa beans, and it was necessary for the elite to stress their special status. Mesoamerica included the Aztecs, which had long distance trade within empire and across borders, Professional merchants, uh, which organized trade, trading large expecta uh, expeditions, sometimes at the request of emperors, mostly for their own profits, and sometimes as spies, and the import of luxury items, like we mentioned before, feathers, cocoa, gems, etc. This is an Aztec feather headdress, and this is Poteca, which was a uh, art. As for South America, which also included the Inca and what is now modern day Peru, they had the trade state controlled, no private merchant class, they had large storehouses for food, clothes, building supplies, weapons, distributed by government agencies needed, and the inventory was recorded on Quipus, which is their sort of uh, recording writing system. The goods were transported by llamas and people, and they had an extensive network of roads in the Andes Mountains. This is a map of Inca cities. This is the Machu Picchu. The Inca Trail, a bridge made out of woven grass. And this is also something to just save and work on at home. So explain the cause and effects of the growth of networks of exchange. Why did the Mongols so show such an interest? This is also something to save. So you can take a second to write this down, copy it down. And then we can take a second to copy the next one down. Okay. Now we can move on to the next one. This is 
working. All right. This is Indian Ocean Exploration. So explain the economic cause and effect of maritime explorations by the various European states. Describe the role of states in the expansion of maritime exploration. Explain how cross-cultural interactions result in the diffusion of technology, the process of state building and expansion, continuities and changes in networks of exchange, and the rulers employing economic strategies to consolidate and maintain power. So these are the guiding questions, the guiding principles of this, of this unit. And this is just the small boat. This is the Columbus boat and the large boat was of a Chinese pirate, which is 400 feet long. This is the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean trade routes. So here's an example of the Indian Ocean monsoon. So the monsoons is the sort of like rain season, the wet season of the Indian Ocean area, and it greatly impacted all the trade. And we're going to see the effects of all of this a little bit later on. So the July monsoon, which is the wet winds, and the January monsoon, which is the dry winds, as you can see, it's moving away, and the July monsoons are moving in. Indian Ocean trade included merchants from Muslim, Indian, and Chinese worlds, which had two types of government, the luxury, the two types of commodity, sorry, luxury and the staple, and the government was protected trade through entrepôts. They commonly observed rules and stability, and merchants frequently spread faith and culture. Geographic locations of this route, you can see, you can see this is China, that's Portugal right there, it's the Indian Ocean. The Ming Dynasty overthrew the Yuan of the Mongols in 1368, and they sought to reestablish past Chinese prominence and power in trade and technology. So they revived old Chinese knowledge, rebuilt the arts, skills, and traditions in silk and porcelain, strengthened Neo-Confucianism, and the best known example was to write a complete encyclopedia of all of the knowledge. The motivations were the emperor who usurped the, the throne from the second emperor who fled abroad, and the emperor sent chief eunuch and fleet to find him and to reestablish the ancient tribute system. So the tribute system was proof of the Chinese superiority. Portuguese motivation was gold, glory, and God, three Gs. So you have the religious zeal, the Prester John, Crusades, trade monopoly, Ottomans, the existence of uh, Masa Musa. This was also during the time of Renaissance and the newfound technology during the time. This was um, the Muslim, he, this man was a Muslim palace, the Zheng, he was a Muslim palace eunuch of the Yongli Empire. His position and knowledge of foreigners in Western lands made him ideal to lead emperor's free fleets. In Nanking, he oversaw the building of the fleet, recruitment of soldiers, sailors, and guides, and much resentment to his expeditions were even among official circles. So he's the pirate we were talking about earlier. He had a very large ship in comparison to uh, Columbus. There's also Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal. So Portugal reconquered land for the Muslims, but was hemmed in by the Castile, which turned seas to make a future. So state ba the state backed overseas exploration, shipbuilding, and schools to train sailors, and they rewarded success through titles and property. Prince Henry led the Portuguese efforts. There are also aware per Portuguese admirals. So Prince Henry's schools trained sailors from all over Europe and the promotion was only based on experience. So sailors taught navigation using the Arab astrolabe, compass, ships designed specifically for the Atlantic, and the fleet pushed into the Atlantic, discovered stories, canneries, and they followed coasts of Africa. The Portuguese conquered Ceuta and Morocco to begin expansion. Now to Africa and the Cape. West Africa was Portugal's training ground. The local states were way more powerful than the Portuguese and they wanted to trade. So the Portuguese learned how to raid and trade and they better sailed, uh, they bettered their sailing knowledge and pushed further south. As for Portuguese naval voyages, they were, this happened in three phases, down African coast to Cape of Good Hope, then to Cape, of in, uh, Cape to India along East African coast and India to China through the Malacca Straits. So fleets and ships were often very small but heavily armed. As you can see here, there's a map of the Corbral, the Alaida, Albuquerque, the Magellan expeditions, so on and so forth. And you can see they're all color coded, showing you the early voyages to the Far East. This was the main naval voyages now. So the seven voyages were called treasure fleets. Ships visited Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Iran, and the Arabian Peninsula, including Yemen and the Red Sea ports like Somalia and Kenya. 
So a typical fleet had around 100 ships, the largest weighing up to 3,000 tons, carrying up to 90,000 troops and sailors. So there was also star rafts and dragon fleets. So a Chinese fleet had hundreds of ships, uh, 130 meter long, nine masted, 3,000 plus tons, crews of thousands, tons of cargoes, and watertight bulkheads and retractable rudders. This was a caravel and nail. So Portuguese ships had to be able to withstand the hazards and the weather of, Atlant of the Atlantic, which were some of the worst on the globe. So sails had to be able to turn as wind direction changed and the bow was high cut to cut the waves. So stern, bow, and fighting castles as ships were sailing forts and are were armed with heavy light guns. Chinese tactics. So Chinese methods could be called the carrot and the stick. So Chinese saw it, um, the trade and the tribute. They needed very little, but others wanted Chinese goods. When states refused to submit, uh, the Chinese prior that we talked about earlier used superior troops, weapons as diplomacy, but only sparingly. Now to the Americas. So there's some question as to whether uh, his fleet may have made it to the Americas around 1421, 1423. The descriptions within the journals of the official voyage seem to match a journey of the west to east past Japan and the illusions down to the west coast of Mexico. As for Portuguese tactics, so at first, threats backed by terror tactics and military technologies, the Portuguese were little less than pirates. Later, they seized control of the choke points, uh, or the straits, and they built forts, monopolized a spice trade, sent out missionaries, and all was all controlled from uh, the central capital in Goa. Just remember, if you're raising your hand, do keep it up for a little bit so I can find you in the participants box. I'm not always able to find them quickly. So there's also, this is a uh, testimony by King Manuel of Portugal and his instructions to the Viceroy Francisco de Almeida in 1505. You can go ahead and read that on your own. We can take this moment to try and source this document. Just three minutes, try to source it best. So we have again, H-I-P-P. -P. So the H <coughs> would be historical. Context. I'll put this in the chat for all of you. I would be intended audience. D would be for purpose. And the last one would be for point of view. So take three minutes at 440. We can go ahead, reconvene, and what type of reconvene, what type of sourcing we would use for this specific this specific uh, primary source. Keep in mind that when you actually do do sort when actually when you actually do sourcing like in class for the AP test, you will need to provide an explanation as to what the purpose or what the point of view intended audience historical context of the primary source is, not just the number. Not just the sorry, but not just the type of sourcing you would do. You would need to provide an explanation as well. But for now, just just the type is alright. 
So I've gotten a purpose and historical context. So let's take a look at what would the purpose be of this. It says, it seems to us nothing would serve us better than to have a fortress at the mouth of the Red Sea or near to it, rather than inside, than outside might afford better control, because from there we would see to it that no spices might pass to the land of the Sultan of Egypt, and all those in India would lose the false notion that they could trade any more, save through us. So the purpose of this would be uh, to stop the trade, of, to sort of restrict the trade, the King Manuel of Portugal. You, we also talked about how uh, Portugal is very, very uh, totalitarian with their trade. They only wanted other countries to trade with them. And so here we see that all those in India would lose a false notion they could trade anymore, save through us, meaning that uh, he wants trade to only happen through Portugal and to none of the other countries to have trade. That is the purpose of this paragraph. Historical context, we could also say, yes, during the uh, Indian Ocean exploration time, this was uh, with the with the warring of, uh, not the warring, the, what's the conflict between uh, Portugal and the Chinese trading. So yes, both of those would work. These are some Portuguese royal institutions and policies to facilitate trade. I'm not gonna read all of them out, but you can absolutely save this. So the Chronicles of the King of Sri Lanka, he also says this, now it came to pass that a ship from Portugal led to Colombo and information was brought to the king that they have guns with a noise like thunder and a ball from one of them after traversing a league will break a castle of marble. You can go ahead sources at home, but we're not gonna take some time to do it. We've got a lot to get through. The Indian Ocean. So Portugal found a thriving trade dominated by Muslim merchants and their states. Portugal sacked most of the Swahili city-states in East Africa and built forts to control key points in India. Portugal had nothing to trade with the Hindus and tried the same tactics. Later, Portugal established markets, forts, missions, and wed local women to control their trade. China benefited a little, so Zhang Qi never found the missing prince. He did reestablish the old tribute system throughout much of the China Sea and the Bay of Bengal, so little except spices was found to trade, although most states did want Chinese porcelain and silks. Portugal came to control the Indian Ocean spice trade, which made the kingdom very wealthy, and the biggest gain out of all of it was the spread of Christianity by missionaries throughout the region. So these, this is a timeline of everything that happened in this Indian Ocean trade. So the Chinese unicorn is a symbol of good fortune and justice, coming with symbolic of good times and peace. The Neo-Confucian doctrine taught that China was at the center of the world and had reached heights of power and influence. They despised merchants, disliked eunuchs, and favored internal development. So the end of the Ming Dynasty came with the northern nomads, the Great Wall, and a new capital and a new emperor. This was a result of Japanese pirates, Grand Canal, the cost of fleets, anti eunuchs and Confucianism. This is comments by the Ming Minister of War. Sorry. This is also an address. As for the Portuguese end, in 1580, the last Portuguese king died, and his nearest male heir was Philip II, the king of Spain, who inherited the crown of Portugal. Spanish interests would come first. So during Spanish rule, Dutch, French, and English encroached on Portuguese markets, empire, and they stole both for their states. So the first to enter and the last to leave. Portugal was the first European nation to establish a colonial empire and last to lose it. In 1960, India annexed Goa, and in 1975, Mozambique gained independence, India, Indonesia took East Timor, and in 1999, Macau was returned to China. These are all Portuguese states. As for Spain, take a look at this. And the conquest of the Aztec Empire by Hernan Cortes in 1519, and he conquered it by 1521. The conquest of the Inca Empire was a mysterious plague and a civil war between Atahualpa and Huascar, and they landed in Peru in 1531, and they conquered by 1535. This is just a statement, primary source. Capture of Atahualpa. Colonial administration during this time was for viceroyalty, so viceroys were appointed by the Spanish king, sent from Spain, and the Catholic Church played an important role in bringing Spanish culture and Christianity to the natives, aggressive Christianization and assimilation. The colonial economy of the encomienda system, which was soon replaced with the hacienda system, the export of mining and agricultural products. The colonial class system, you can save this for later. 
This is the map. The Columbian Exchange, which was, so explain the causes of the Columbian Exchange and its effects on the Eastern and Western Hemispheres. So this is the Columbian Exchange. Its democratic effect, demographic effects included population growth in Eurasia and Africa. The environmental effects included deforestation, invasive species, and the rewilding of some parts of the Americas. So this is the world population in millions, just a table that you can take a look at. This is the first truly global trade. Some data from the Geological Survey Report. In, in England, France, and the Netherlands. So France began with Cartier, looking for the Northwest Passage in Canada, who began to get involved in the fur trade. England came to the Hudson, looking for the Northwest Passage in Canada as well, and it made colonies in North America and the Indian Ocean. The Netherlands established colonies in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, such as Batavia on Java and Spice Islands. They also had joint stock and chartered companies, which was private investors, and the main goal was to make a profit, establish trading, and have jurisdiction over their territory. Okay, that's a map that you can take a look at. And mercantilism, which was the economic theory developed in the 17th century by English and French economics. So they trade, which basically trade was only allowed with the mother country. All right, we still have got quite a bit to get through, so we're gonna get, try to get through it as fast as possible on Mesoamerican civilizations. Right, I am closing the chat, by the way. Mesoamerican civilizations, let's get started. So the Olmec in 1300 BC was the first civilization in Mesoamerica. They were along Gulf of Mexico and south of Veracruz. They had large cities that were centers for religious rituals and they carved colossal stone heads, which may have been to represent ancestors or gods. Titlhuacan was the first major city in Mesoamerica around 250 BC and collapsed about 800 AD. It may have had about 200,000 inhabitants at its height and it had a main thoroughfare. And then it's the Avenue of Dead, which had two main temples, which were the Temple of the Sun and the Temple of the Moon. Mayan civilization was located in the Mexican and Central American rainforest. It was uh, represented by Chichen Itza and the group of city-states ruled by a king. The economy was based on agriculture and trade, and it had a polytheistic religion, which was uh, with the pyramids. The Yucatan Peninsula, also the Mayan were found the Yucatan Peninsula in part of Guatemala, and they flourished during uh, 13, 300 and 900 AD. We do not know why it fell to decline, and the Mayans abandoned their cities, and there is no evidence as to why they did so. There's also political and social structure, which cities were built around a central pyramid. The pyramid was topped with a shrine to the gods, and for city-states, each was governed by a hereditary ruling class. As for Maya society, they had a very complex class structure. So their upper class included kings, priests, warriors, and merchants, and their lower class included most of the Maya. So farmers had to give crops to rulers to serve in the army, and slaves held the lowest position in society. Slaves included orphans, slaves children, and people who owed money. Mayan kings were the people who ruled the Mayan kingdoms. They claimed they were divine, and they were assisted by nobles and class of scribes. They made special blood blood sacrifices to maintain the kingdom and people who included townspeople, skilled artisans, officials, merchants. Many people were peasant farmers who worked on the terraced hillsides farming and men did the fighting and hunting while women uh, made cornmeal and were responsible for homemaking and uh, taking care of the children. So religions of the Maya. The Maya were polytheistic. They believed that all life was in the hands of divine power and they were responsible for pleasing the gods. So their gods were ranked in order of uh, importance as the jaguar was a god of night and was seen as evil. And the Maya practiced human sacrifice to appease their gods. Human sacrifice was also used to mark special occasions. A king ascended to the throne. Uh, war captives were tortured and beheaded to uh, mark the sacrifice. 
Mayan warfare in, uh, continued with Mayan cities, usually battling each other to gain power. Warfare was very bloody, and they fought hand-to-hand -hand using spears, flint knives, and wooden clubs. They often killed enemy prisoners, burned enemy towns and villages, and warfare may have led to the destruction of the Mayan civilization. As for accomplish accomplishments in language, the Maya developed an independent hieroglyphic language. The Spanish destroyed, however, many of the Mayan writings. They were not seen as having any value. Their language was not even translated until the 20th century. The Mayan calendar, probably the most famous of Mayan uh, pieces. So the Maya developed a calendar that had many different parts. It was a solar calendar with 365 days, and uh, it's a sacred calendar. A lunar calendar, when a calendar based the movement of the planet Venus. The Mayan calendar says our present world was created in 3, uh, 31114 BC. Uh, 3, 3114 BC, and the current era will end on December 23rd, 2012 AD. Maya achievements included art, sculpture, cities using metal tools, uh, calendared number systems, and writing systems similar to Egyptian hieroglyphics we just went over. Causes of decline in the Mayan civilization began to collapse in around 900, and the causes were generally unknown. Probably a mix of uh, disease, kings making demands in a long period of dry weather. This is a Mayan city. Chichen Itza is right here. Here's the map. The Aztec civilization began around the 12th century in, a in AD. It was located in an arid valley in Mexico, and it was represented by Tenochtitlan, ruled by an empire, and the economy was based on agriculture and tribute from the conquered people. This also had uh, polytheism. So this is just some of the Aztec legends we'll go over, but you can go ahead and save this. As for political and social structure, by 1500, there were around 8 million people in the Aztec Empire. The Aztec Emperor ruled over the Aztec Empire, and he was considered a supreme leader, claimed to be divine, and the people were made up of commoners, indentured workers, and slaves. Many people were farmers, but also traded, and men were warriors, while a woman's role was to be in the home. They were allowed to inherit property, enter contracts, and they wove textiles and raised children. They could also be priestesses or holy people. Teotihuacan around uh, 400 CE had a population of about 200,000 people. Tenochtitlan had around 150,000 and 1,500, and Tenochtitlan in the middle of Lake Texcoco, surrounded by Chinampas, and the central zone with palace and temples surrounded by residential zones, smaller palaces, markets, gardens, and a zoo. This is Tenochtitlan. This is economy and government. So state controlled use and distribution of many commodities, as many gained as tribute from conquered areas. Local markets were controlled by clans, big market for long distance trade, which was controlled by the merchant class, and the government regulated exchange of goods, sent inspectors to supervise trade, and many city states were in central Mexico. The population of the Aztec Empire was around 1,500, about 20 million. This is Chinampas in Lake Texcoco. The so religion had a polytheistic religion based on warfare. So I can't pronounce the name, but he was their chief god, sorry, or their god of the sun, and the Aztec offered him human sacrifice to give him strength to battle the force of darkness each night so that he could rise each morning. They also had Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, and they believed he had left the valley of Mexico and promised to return in triumph and the human sacrifice. So each Aztec city contained a pyramid where they practiced human sacrifice to postpone the end of the world. There was also the destruction of the Aztec people. The subjugation of the people of the Aztec Empire bred hatred and discontent among the people. The Spanish arrived. They did not have a difficult time finding allies to fight the Aztecs. It was conquered by Hernan Cortes in 1519. Hernan Cortes was a Spanish conquistador who came to the Valley of Mexico in 1519 with 550 soldiers and 16 horses. He was at first greeted by the Aztec Emperor Montezuma. The Spanish later kidnapped the emperor and made him a puppet. Many of the natives have also fallen ill with smallpox, and the Spanish uh, began to spread smallpox. smallpox. This is an example of some of the art of the Aztecs. As for Incan civilization, they were located in the Andes Mountains of South America, represented by the Machu Picchu in Peru, and they were ruled by an empire. So their economy was based on high-altitude agriculture. They had a polytheistic religion and a road system. So in late 1300s, Inca started as a small group that were located in Cusco. They did not become uh, powerful after the fall of the Mocha of Peru, and uh, Pachacuti unified the Inca and established the Inca Empire. 
the organization of the empire. So the Inca state was built on war and the conquered peoples were all taught the same language. They had a road system as mentioned before and they were rest houses and storage depots. The culture, many were required to marry within their own group. They were farmers, they herded llamas and alpacas. This is some of their buildings. The, they were very great builders. And this is around Lake Titicaca. The defeat was in 1531 with Francisco Pizarro and the smallpox civil war uh, both defeated the Incas. Some achievements of their civilizations. So now very, very quickly, we'll have to go over uh, gender in four, 1200 to 1450. So gender relations during this time. So here are some questions we need to go over. So explain how the effects of Chinese cultural religions over time, explain how Islam, Christianity, and Judaism continue to shape societies in Europe, Africa, and Asia, and explain how Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism continue to shape societies in South and Southeast Asia. So gender in Europe. So Christianity and forced monogamy. So the supposed children who were not born from a uh, from a married couple did not have inheritance rights. Some women could live as nuns in all female communities, but could not be priest. Priest uh, nuns often ran hospitals and the veneration of the Virgin Mary and female saints was very widespread. Most rulers during the time were male, but some examples of individual queens ruling in their own rights were Isabella from Castile and Queen Maud in England. Queens lost their influence of household finances to bureaucrats who were trained in universities. Women could inherit property or territory if there was no male heir. Grain was based, grain based agriculture had a division of labor and while men were clearing the land, plowing, taking large, uh, care of large animals, women took care of small animals, spinning and food processing. Some nuns attending to the sick. This is a primary source. Again, you can take this, uh, save this and take a look at it at home. And gender in the Islamic world. So the Quran allowed men and women to go to heaven, partake in pilgrimages, veiling and seclusion of women were already practices in pre-Islamic times. And so the Quran just gave more rights to men. So up to four wives, daughters only inherit half. Testimony of the men outweighs that of women and hadith supported seclusion and veiling, although the Quran is not entirely clear about that. Women could also invest into real estate, but could not run businesses of their own. Manual labor and household tax tests were often done by slave women who did not have to be veiled, and rural women had to help with outside work, and therefore seclusion and veiling was not strictly enforced. This is a piece from the Quran dic dictating some of the gender relations of Islam. As for Africa, so African traditions mixed with Islamic. So many uh, societies were matrilinear. So girls were often seen as a source of wealth, like a wealth, like a bride price. And in India and the Middle East, brides had to bring a dowry into their marriage. So polygamy was widespread even before Islam, and women were often responsible for growing crops and could sell their, sell their goods in local markets. Many local traders were female, and the queen mother was an official title in many African states, as women could hold some official power in the government. Women as religious leaders, however, were still not acceptable. This is another source by Ibn Battuta about uh, Africa. This is uh, Queen Idia of Benin showing the, uh, some of the power that women had in Africa. Gender in the Islamic world and India. So both Hinduism and Islam encouraged seclusion to report that. So girls often married at a very young age, had to bring dairy into marriage, and sati was practiced in the upper class Hindu families, which meant uh, once the husband died, the, uh, the wife would kill herself. So Muslim rulers tried to outlaw sati. Muslim gender relations in India were also very similar to the Middle East, and women in both Hinduism and Islam excluded from positions in religious hierarchy. There was a caste system and the Jatis still continued to determine the women's role in society. Yes, that is what Sati was, as that when the husband would die, the woman would kill herself. So this is just a sample of some of the primary sources. Gender in East Asia. So uh, Confucianism stressed the subordinates of wives, rise of the Neo-Confucianism and decline of uh, Buddhism, and married women moved in with the husband's family, mother-in-laws had influence over life, and upper-class widows were forbidden from remarrying. There was also foot bindings, which severely limited the ability to travel. This is a woman playing a Chinese instrument, and notice these small feet. 
gender in East Asia continued with military dictatorship in Japan. This 1180 and the spread of Neo-Confucian ideas which limited the role of women. Some actual local communities where women were diverse for seaweed or seafood and women could still join Buddhist monasteries. Some women and noble families were also expected to manage household while the husbands were away and even defended the castle in absence of, in absence of their husbands. Here are some Neo-Confucian inspired sayings that you can take a look at. Okay, so that was a lot of content that we went over today. So if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead. I'll open up the chat for, you can only chat with panelists. And uh, the Q&A is open. You can go ahead and raise your hand, make sure to keep it up. But any questions, this is the last class. We finished the 1200 to 1450 era. So any questions, the last class. No questions at all. All right. Well, thank you for coming. And that's it. Well, that is the last class. I hope you guys learned a lot. And I hope this 1200 to 1450 era is really helpful for those of you who are looking to take WAP in the future. So, bye. Oh, someone asked, why do you think that women were so undermined in these cultures? Well, generally, this also stemmed from some of the religious beliefs, like as we said in the Quran, in a Neo-Confucianism, uh, such things like that. They thought women were meant to only take care of the children and such. All right. Thank you. Bye.